Last time, we left off wondering why our node impurity heuristic yielded the same exact result across all four possible splits for our toy data. Let's dig a bit deeper into our heuristic and see if we can figure out where we went wrong. Last time, we plotted our impurity heuristic, I of P, the minority class fraction, as a function of the positive examples in our nodes, P. Our resulting graph was pretty reasonable. Nodes with all positive or all negative examples had zero impurity. Nodes with an equal number of positive and negative examples had a maximum impurity of one half, and our impurity varied linearly between these extremes. So why did our heuristic not behave as expected? Let's have a closer look at the inner workings of our heuristic across our various splits. To keep things organized, let's introduce a few new variables. For a given split, let's call the fraction of positive examples in our left node P sub L, the fraction of positive examples in our right node P sub R, and the total fraction of all positive examples before splitting P sub zero. And from last time, we have our variable alpha, which tells us the fraction of examples that end up on each side of our split. Let's consider how our variables change across various splits. For each split, we'll keep track of PL, PR, and alpha. As a baseline, let's compute the fraction of positive examples before splitting at P0. Since we're starting out with three positive and two negative examples, our initial positive class fraction P0 is 3 fifths. Now, as we experiment with various splits, we see that although our variables do take on different values for different splits, these differences seem to cancel out resulting in the same unremarkable impurity for each split, two-fifths. And even more disappointing is the fact that this total impurity is exactly equal to the impurity measure we started with. According to our impurity heuristics, our splits have gained us nothing. Now, why did this happen? Why do all the changes in our variables across our various splits cancel out? Is there some underlying mechanism we're missing here that is causing our results to come out the same each time? Symbolically, why does I of P0 seem to always exactly equal the weighted average of I of PL and I of PR? Are these quantities linked together in some fundamental and annoying way? To get to the bottom of this, let's consider in more detail how our splits divide up our data. Specifically, let's try to relate the fraction of positive examples in our left and right nodes, PL and PR, to our overall fraction of positive examples, P0. For our X3 split, we know that our left node contains three-fifths of all our data, and that two-thirds of this data is positive. So the positive examples in our left node should represent three-fifths times two-thirds, or two-fifths of all of our data. Using our variable names, these positive examples in our left node represent a portion of all examples equal to alpha times PL. We can apply the same argument to our right node and see that the positive examples in this node represent a portion of all our examples equal to one minus alpha times PR. And since the positive examples in our left node plus the positive examples in our right node must equal the total number of positive examples, P0 must equal alpha times PL plus one minus alpha times PR. So regardless of the impurity metric we choose, it's probably good to know that simply as a result of the mechanics of our splitting process, our positive class fraction before splitting, P0, will always be equivalent to the weighted average of the positive class fractions of our left and right nodes. So we found one interesting connection between our variables, but it's not clear why all our variations are canceling out, resulting in a constant overall impurity across all our splits. Let's see if we can leverage our new connection to gain some more insight. Remember, we're trying to figure out why it seems that our impurity before splitting, I of P0, is always exactly equal to our impurity after splitting, the weighted average of I of PL and I of PR. Using our new discovery, we can now replace P0 with the weighted average of PL and PR. Now, do we have any reason to believe this equation is true? To get to the bottom of this, we need to think about linear functions. These functions linearly map their inputs to their outputs, resulting in some important properties. Namely, a linear function of a sum is equal to the sum of the linear function, evaluated on each part of the sum individually. And a linear function of a scalar times a variable is equal to the scalar times the linear function of the variable. So linear functions preserve addition and scalar multiplication. Now, if we hop back to our key equation, 
Since our impurity function is linear, we can apply our properties of linear functions to show that the left side of our equation is in fact completely equivalent to the right side. As long as our impurity heuristic is linear with respect to our positive class fraction, our impurity will remain exactly the same after splitting, because our linear impurity function of our weighted average is exactly equal to the weighted average of our linear impurity functions. We've uncovered our missing link from earlier. The linearity of our impurity function means that as long as our majority classes don't flip in any of our nodes, any gains we make on one side of our tree are exactly cancelled out by the other resulting in the same impurity measure for every split. So what should we do then? The linearity of our impurity function seems to be our real issue here, so perhaps we should consider a nonlinear impurity function. Of course, just deciding our impurity should be nonlinear is not that helpful, because after all there are quite a few nonlinear functions out there. And it seems unlikely that all nonlinear functions are good measures of impurity. So let's be a little more specific about the properties our impurity heuristic needs to possess. We know we don't want our impurity before splitting to be equal to our impurity after splitting. And if we had to choose, what we would really like to see here is for our impurity before splitting to be greater than our impurity after splitting. This would mean that our impurity decreases after splitting, exactly the kind of behavior we're looking for from a good split when growing our tree. Now, what kind of impurity function would give this behavior? For what class of functions would this inequality hold? What would a function like this look like? How would it compare to our unsuccessful linear impurity function? It's probably still a good idea to have our impurity function equal zero when our node contains only positive or negative examples, and reach a maximum when our node is half negative, half positive. Now, what should our new function look like between these extremes? We would like the impurity before splitting to be greater than the impurity after splitting. That is, we want our function of our weighted averages to be greater than the weighted average of our functions. What does a nonlinear function with this property look like? Let's visualize the various parts of our inequality separately and see if we can gain some insight. Given the three variables in our inequality, PL, PR, and alpha, we can determine P0, our positive class fraction before splitting. Since P0 is the weighted average of PL and PR, it will fall between these two values. Where exactly P0 will fall between PL and PR is controlled by alpha. An alpha value of 1 means that all of our examples go left, so P0 will equal PL. As we decrease alpha, P0 moves away from PL and towards PR. And the fraction of the total distance between PL and PR, covered between PL and P0, equals exactly alpha. So an alpha value of 1 half means P0 will fall right in the middle of PL and PR. For the sake of visualization, let's choose points for our impurities before splitting, I of PL and I of PR. Our impurity should increase as we approach the center of our plot, so we'll make I of PR larger than I of PL. Now let's consider the whole right side of our inequality, the weighted average of our impurities. Where will this value fall on our plot? As we saw with P0, PL, and PR, we can visually interpret weighted averages, like the one on the right side of our inequality, as a balance between two values, controlled by alpha. In this case, our two values are I of PL and I of PR, so our weighted average will live between these two extremes, at a location controlled by alpha. All right, here's where all our tedious variable manipulation gets interesting. Notice that the two weighted averages we've considered are both controlled by the same fraction, alpha. When alpha equals 1, since all of our examples are in our left node, our total impurity after splitting is just equal to the impurity in our left node, I of PL. Alternatively, when alpha equals 0, all our examples are in our right node, and our total impurity after splitting is equal to the impurity in our right node. Now, what happens to our impurity after splitting? our weighted average of impurity functions between our two extremes as we vary alpha. We still don't know what our impurity function itself should be, but since our impurity after splitting is just the weighted average of the two values of our impurity function, we can actually compute exactly what our impurity after splitting will look like for any value of alpha. For example, if alpha equals 1 half, P0 will fall directly in the middle of PL and PR and our impurity after splitting will fall directly in the middle of I of PL and I of PR. 
As we vary alpha further, we see that our impurity after splitting falls on a straight line between I of PL and I of PR. So we now have a good understanding of what the right side of our inequality looks like. Given a PL and PR, our impurity after splitting will fall somewhere on the line between I of PL and I of PR. And the location on the line of our impurity after splitting is controlled by our split fraction alpha. Now, what about the left side of our inequality, our impurity before splitting? How should this term show up on our plot? We know that for any value of alpha between 0 and 1, we would like i of p0 to be greater than the weighted average of i of pl and i of pr. And all of these values form a line between i of pl and i of pr. We now have enough information to really figure out what our impurity function should look like. We've already chosen values for our function at PL and PR. And for any P0 between PL and PR, we know that our impurity function of P0 must be greater than the line formed by our weighted average between I of PL and I of PR. Now, assuming we would like our function to be smooth, the only shape that meets all our criteria is a curve like this. For each P0 between PL and PR, the value on our curve, our impurity before splitting, is greater than the corresponding value on our line, our impurity after splitting. So the class of functions we were looking for, the functions that make our inequality true, are the family of functions that curve downwards, concave functions. In fact, the property that we've been searching for, that the function of the average is greater than the average of the functions, is the defining characteristic that makes concave functions concave. The definition of a concave function exactly matches the property we were looking for in our impurity function. So the impurity function we've been searching for must curve downward. It must be concave. This is the final piece of our puzzle. Now there are of course many concave functions out there. And perhaps not surprisingly, our statistics and machine learning researchers chose what appear to be quite different approaches. Next time, we'll sort out these approaches and finally build our decision tree.